working platforms, followed by a couple of case studies too. Working platforms are literally a plain granular soil on the surface, but believe me, that mundane gray brown surface is a box of excitement that includes innovation, extensive research and efficient design. Eddie and I have a very shiny key and we're going to unlock that box for you today. So who, who are we? Um, and in engineering consultants, we're a family owned company specializing in demolition and temporary works engineering design. We have been around since 1990 and operated uh, operate from three offices around the UK. Our head office is in Chelmsford in Essex. Um, our Midlands office is in Newcastle under Lyme and we have a, an office in Scotland in Aberdeen too. We've worked on some of the largest construction projects in the UK with a specialist role in uh, rail projects. We also undertake work on nuclear construction and decommissioning, specialist lifting gear, high rise and industrial demolition, marine works, basement construction and forensic engineering. Temporary works is our bread and butter day in and day out from simple things like hoardings to uh, complex demolition of high rise structures in city centres and things. With me today, I've got a little help. Um, Eddie uh, Emblen from Geosynthetics. Um, Geosynthetics are a, um, excuse me, Geosynthetics are a manufacturer of soil reinforcement products. And Eddie is a experienced chartered engineer, uh, civil engineer and a technical manager of a team who's provided me with some um, specialist support in the past as Geosynthetics provide engineering support on their products, which is really quite helpful. Eddie is part of a team who are pushing the innovation in this area of ground engineering and producing some exciting stuff, including value engineering of some granular working platforms. And that is exactly what we're going to talk to you about today. Piling platform design and construction. So let's peel it right back to the basics to see what we're looking at here. What exactly is a piling platform? The purpose of a working platform is to provide a safe and durable working surface for which pile rigs and plant can operate. They are simple structures that are used widely across the industry to ensure that plant remains stable whilst in operation. And they are often designed for piling rigs to begin with, but then used to all sorts of plant as well as uh, follow on trades such as foundations for scaffolding and things. The main criteria is that they must enable plant to remain stable while in operation and tracking around. They must not deform excessively under load and they must be robust to enable the prolonged use in some cases. They must allow plant to operate properly, allowing, for example, allowing um, pile rigs to sprag. That is when they kind of just t turn with one track going one direction, one in the other. Um, other criteria might be that the, the pile mat needs to provide a CBR level, minimum CBR level for foundations for the permanent works. Uh, such as underneath ground bearing slabs and foundations. It could also be a base for um, uh, a base for the it's like the scaffold foundations, as I've, I've mentioned. It could also provide contamination capping solution on remedial sites, uh, which is a great advantage that we've worked with a couple of remediation contractors a couple of times to do that. It's worth thinking about how the mat can work harder for you and, and double up or even triple up on its uses. It really doesn't have to be a standalone design and single solution. Get the planning right and the site works will run very smoothly. There's lots of information available on the design, construction and maintenance of working platforms, which can be used by both designers and contractors alike. A publication by BRE 470 and one by the Temporary Works Forum are shown here, but there are others available such as uh, Serial 123, uh, further research carried out by BRE, as well as uh, lots of uh, manufacturers of geogrids who have their own specification sheets and things too. Now we're gonna run through the main types of piling platforms used and the big three being a pure granular mat, also known as an unreinforced granular mat, a geogrid reinforced mat and a chemically stabilized mat too. Pile rigs can run on existing concrete slabs or timber mats without a granular platform um, as well. Uh, I mean, I've, I've previously justified pile rigs operating on raised um, slabs um, where the pile rig was piling through the basement in a sleeved pile. So then the rig didn't have to go into the basement. There was no demolition required, but we're not really gonna cover these areas as they're very project specific. Um, 
You've heard of the big five safari animals in the African plain. Well, here we have the big three pile mats in the world of working platforms. The first one is mat number one and running on that safari theme, this is a very common animal. It is basic and simple in construction and is essentially putting down some decent engineered fill to improve the bearing capacity of the ground. Its design and construction has been well established and there is great guidance provided by uh, BRE among others. The BRE's working platforms for track plants document uh, BRE 470. Um, it's great, but it is limited in its application. For example, it cannot be used for very soft or very stiff soils. And many designers, including ourselves, have streamlined some of the methodologies uh, in this document to produce a more efficient design. Some of the pros of this platform is that it's simple to build, it's inert, it's easy to maintain, and there is opportunity to reuse site one material that may be in abundance if you have just demolished, say, a, a multi story concrete framed building um, it can be used into into the mat if you've got loads of it you can just chuck it in but because the main negative is that it generally provides the deepest mat buildup overall I'm now briefly going to cover the kind of information that we would require to design a granular mat and this information also lends itself to the other types too uh, these are um, loading information uh, BRE 470 load cases for rigs, um, uh, these are provided by the piling contractor, an excerpt shown on the left there of typically what we'd be provided with. Um, the area and location of the piling work shown on a, a plan drawing with a proposed pile level uh, abbreviated to PPL. And uh, site investigation is important. The site investigation report, any site tests or lab tests, borehole logs, etc. This tells the designer essentially what the ground is like, because understanding the ground profile and the soil you're working with is a, a key requirement. This is the foundation of the platform and an accurate understanding of the soil strength that you have is the only way to produce the, the right design. If you don't understand the problem, you cannot provide the solution. Here you can see an example where I've shown the proposed pile level across the varying ground levels, um, taking a kind of a section through site. This then showed to me what kind of the soil type is where, where the ground level, uh, groundwater levels lie, because um, groundwater can have a significant impact on the strength of the um, substrata and hence the what put, um, working platform design. Uh, the water is not something to be taken for granted, uh, which we'll see a little bit later on. Here is a typical um, design output relating to a pile mat design. As a minimum, uh, there needs to be uh, one, a detailed description of the required construction of the pile mat and associated designer's risk assessment. Uh, this, this kind of would be a specification and a company DRA, if, if you will. And then number two is a working platform certificate to hand to the piling contractor. These documents will describe the construction requirements. They'll highlight any residual hazards and will specify the required testing, which is absolutely necessary to bring the mat into use. A desired design output is also a drawing, which is kind of shown on the left there, um, showing the mat extents and some details. However, for simple schemes, this is usually just a, a quick sketch showing where, where the mat's going to be in, in the runoff area. So I've covered the basics of a pure crush mat and the design inputs and output that is applicable for all mats, more or less. Um, now I'm gonna hand over to Eddie, who um, will discuss geogrid reinforced platforms and the design principles of the load spread method, which is a similar design approach that we use too. So um, good morning, Eddie, and, and welcome to the webinar. Good morning, Josh, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for that, Josh. Um, so as Josh has said, uh, we're now going to have a, a look through how, how we can use a geogrid um, to benefit the value engineering and sustainability benefits when we're looking at uh, piling mats in particular. So the picture on the screen there is uh, one from many of the schemes that we've done. This one happens to be in Petersfield uh, in Hampshire, and it shows the typical arrangement of a non-woven geotextile going down first on the in-situ material. This is purely for um, providing a separation and filtration function. 
Uh, and then directly above that, uh, we have the reinforcing geogrid um, laid directly on the geotextile above which uh, the granular stone um, is placed. So a nice photograph there showing uh, a nice organised contractor where he's got the, the rolls of geogrid all nicely laid out, the rolls of geotextile underneath. You can see he's working left to right. Uh, and it's very, very important. I'll probably say this on a later, later slide again because it's a, a pet subject of mine. It's very important that the contractor um, coordinates his, his working methods and his stone delivery so such that the plant um, doesn't directly traffic uh, on the geogrid or, geo, uh, or, or, or geotextile products. So you need to get that covered with a, um, a small, small layer of stone first to spread it out and then compact it, but um, no direct plant um, uh, on top of the, the geosynthetic products. That's going to compromise the design and damage the products and uh, not enable them to do uh, what, what we want them to do. Uh, next slide, please, Josh. Okay, so um, on one of Josh's earlier slides, not quite the first slide, but he referenced a couple of documents, uh, BRE 470 and also the Temporary Works Forum Design Guide for Granular Platforms. Uh, my next two slides are extracts from that document, the Temporary Works Forum Guide. Uh, this is a document that was published pretty recently, just over two years ago now. Um, and it's a document that um, good news is it's free to download, um, unlike BRE 470, which you have to purchase. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a plus from the start, uh, start starting point. Uh, from our perspective as um, material designers and suppliers, um, it reflects some of the latest design protocols that have been developed and evolved over recent terms. Um, and in particular, it allows the use of multiple layers of a reinforcing product within the platform. That's a big benefit for us. And also it rec uh, recognizes the different behaviors of different types of geosynthetic products, for example, woven or non-woven geotextiles and ge uh, versus high, high modulus geogrids, which I'll come on to talk about more in, in a moment. And equally, as Josh has alluded as well, uh, the Temporary Works Forum document enables uh, the use of a wider range of in situ soil properties when compared to BRE 470. Uh, so within geosynthetics, the method that we use is what's known as the reinforced soil raft method. Uh, and the, the key factor of this is, is that it gives an increase in the load distribution angle um, of, 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 the, of, of the load through the, through the stone platform that we're gonna be, gonna be building. Next slide, thank you. So the highlighted box um, draws attention to that very key aspects of our design methodology. And this is that we want to mobilize as much strength of the product um, as we can, in particular at very low strains um, as possible. Uh, in order to do this, we use a high modulus polypropylene um, jig with a very high junction strength. Um, so that's to say when we're only looking at the, the strength at 2% elongation, uh, the ultimate tensile strength of the product is, is not relevant for this design methodology. And once, uh, once we're looking at the 2% elongation, we use the tensile modulus uh, of the product in our calculations at, at that particular elongation. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. So a reinforced soil raft foundation is a combined structure that is made up with granular material, that's very important, and one or more layers of geogrids. The reinforced soil raft concept is based on the design method of reinforcement proposed by Giroux and A-Line Bonaparte in 1985, and also the Tizagi method to calculate the bearing capacity of the foundation soil. Uh, the geogrid improves the load distribution through the geogrid and aggregate interlocking me me mechanism. That's to say that by providing additional lateral restraint and mechanical interlock between the stone and the geogrid, and we can see on the picture on the right hand side how that how, how that works with the, the stones partially penetrating the apertures of the geogrid. And on the left hand side, they're just a diagram showing how, how, uh, how different load bearing areas distribute the loads throughout the soil beneath uh, differently. Next slide, please, Josh, thanks. Um, so the way we uh, quantify this improvement is, as I said, by an increase in the angle of the load distribution pyramid. And for a given depth of stone, as you can see on the screen there, the compacted particles uh, within that stone depth, basically when you compact them together, they create a nice crunchy mix, they knit together, enabling the loads to be dispersed at the load distribution um, angle as shown. Uh, next slide, please, Josh. Um, so what you can see there is with the addition of the dotted red, red line there to um, 
represent the, the geogrid by incorporating a geogrid or sometimes more layers of geogrid as we've we'll seen a case study to follow uh, the additional lateral restraint and mechanical interlock that the geogrid provides increases the load distribution angle um, quite significantly as shown um, as a rule of thumb typical angles without uh, angles of uh, load dispersal without geogrid reinforcement would be within the range of sort of 35 to 40 degrees maybe um, obviously things vary on site specific calculations but just to give you a, a general feel for things there and by incorporating layer a layer or multiple layers of geogrid that angle is going to typically increase to something of the range of 50 to 60 degrees um, so the way this diagram is drawn on the screen this basically enables either a greater load for that given depth of platform to be used or perhaps even increased longevity uh, between maintenance intervals or repair um, Network Rail, for example, is one of our customers that use this uh, method. Uh, and by um, using this method, um, it enables them to keep their tracks open longer, therefore less disruption to the traveling public uh, by doing so. More commonly, and certainly in the case of piling mats, um, we use this mathematical model that's on the screen and kind of invert it, flip it on its head, if you like, to enable the geogrid, the use of the geogrid to reduce the depth uh, of the stone required. That's, that's the main aim we're looking for with the geogrid reinforcement in the stone platforms. Thanks, Josh. Um, so the parameters that we require to define the geogrid reinforcement are firstly the required strength, the design strength at 2% strain, like I've mentioned, um, aperture size and, and interlocking with the fill material is key. Different stone, um, again, dependent on costs, the contractor might uh, elect to use a stone with a larger, uh, a larger size or a smaller size. We have a range of geogrids um, to, to, to fit within those uh, criteria to basically maximize the amount of mechanical interlock that we achieve. Um, the platform material, uh, the import and the on-site material and also the, the, the pull-out resistance. So we have many examples of reinforcement sites. Um, forest, forest side down in Petersfield, this was the slide that I showed at the start of my session. Uh, British Museum down in London, that was quite a nice complicated site due to working in such close proximity to the museum and all its valuable artefacts. Uh, a Beckham Cell lands, uh, drilling site in Lancashire, uh, Abraham Derby School in Telford, and then Wood Wharf uh, down in London, a piling mat down there right on the banks of the River Thames, which we're going to cover uh, later on. But uh, for now, that's all for me. I'm going to hand back to Josh to, to take the reins again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie. So now here, here we have a view of a platform and what a view. Let's, let's just feast your eyes on this. It's a stabilised mat and that's what you've tuned in for, folks. A beautiful pile mat. So drink it all in. Uh, this is the top surface of a high performance composite mat constructed from a layer of cement stabilized soil and, and then with a 6F2 granular wearing course on top. So that's what you can see there. Um, and let's take a, sec uh, take a look of it, a section through this, this mat. So this is a, a chemically, chemically stabilized mat um, using the existing soil, mixing it with cement or lime to modify the composition and, and strengthen it. This material cures uh, to become something much stiffer than the previous soil, creating a bonded stiff layer of well-compacted engineered fill. On top of this layer, we then specify a, a, a layer of geotextile, not a geogrid, a geotextile that prevents um, the fines migration and also acts as a marker layer between the wearing course and the stabilized soil. Then on top of that, generally a 100 to 200 mil of 6F2 is, is placed on top as a, a wearing course. Now this wearing course really is very important as it becomes contaminated with pile arisings that result from the concrete spilling out or other rubbish that's tracked into the mat. This layer can be removed and then redressed as part of the proper maintenance um, of, the, of the working platform. This top layer also allows the machine to sprag uh, that is to move its tracks in opposite directions uh, to spin on the spot. Spragging on the bonded stabilised uh, material below on its own uh, could lead to tearing the bonded soil and resulting in, in fissures that would fill with water if it rained. Um, this water would then be pumped out uh, when it was loaded and tracked over. And then this re repeated uh, pumping and pumping action could lead to um, soft spots and, and uh, deterioration of the map. Um, so really, this, the wearing course is the magic dust on top of the solution that, that makes it so usable. Stabilised pile mat design is a specialised area, 
and although there is research available on the subject, there's no real established method of design like there is, say, for the pure crush mat. Here at Anden, we have our own design methods, which are based on our uh, own extensive research and have been proven uh, every time in the field. It's an effective design methodology that's been you know, used to great effect time and time again and stands up to scrutiny uh, when it has been CAT3 checked and submitted to approval authorities such as Network Rail on many occasions. <clears throat> if we break down the process, I've got some photos to show you. Um, it all starts with the preparation of the formation level. Proof rolling, removing soft spots and backfilling with engineered fill. The compaction works um, usually carried out in accordance with um, specification for highway works six, uh, series 600. So this is, the, this is the formation level. No stabilizing. This is just the, the, once the soil has been stripped back down to formation level and prepared here. Next is the exciting bit. Here is creating the stabilized layer. Sometimes a tractor tow is a stabilizing unit as shown. Um, on larger projects, a specialized stabilizing machine is used, um, but both achieve the same thing, essentially mixing the chemicals with the soil. The hopper at the front drops a measured amount of cement or lime onto the ground, and then before it was mixed. This mix uh, depth is usually um, up to 300 mil or three, 350 maximum. So for a stabilized layers that are, are deeper, for a stabilized layer, which is say um, 600 deep, um, you'd need to stabilize the first half of that in situ and then put some more fill on top of that and then stabilize that again in situ, or you, you, can, in, uh, you can do it outside and import it in and compact it, but usually it's done in situ like that. An overlapping of these layers um, is also specified um, to make sure that each layer kind of bites into the other and, and we get a sufficient bond. Uh, once the stabilized layer is down, it's then compacted again to highway spec uh, before the mix begins to harden and, and cure. Once that's happened, um, we can dress the top with the geotextile and install the wearing course on top. Hey, presto, bingo, we've got one stabilized mat. Um, what are the benefits of these and why are they so effective? Well, I'm gonna leave you on a little bit of a cliffhanger there and, and discuss that a little bit later. So onto some uh, power mats in general, we've covered the big three. And what do we do with these uh, risks that are associated with working platforms? The, bis the big risk of a failure of a platform uh, is failure of it. Uh, the power mats can fail due to the incorrect design solution. Uh, maybe a, 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 an unsuitable proposed piling level or platform type or sequence. Poorly constructed platforms or the dreaded soft spots, dare I say it, soft spots. Um, experience has shown that it's far more likely that rigs will overturn owing to localized problems like soft spots, um, as opposed to a generally inadequate platform thickness across the whole site. Um, so how do we deal with these soft spots? Um, well, they're defined as localized areas on the ground which are weaker relative to the rest of the site. Soft spots are areas that are weaker than the soil considered during the design. So these can generally uh, and easily be identified through proof rolling on sites as the soil will heave uh, either side of your roller, uh, which would then identify the soft spot. Um, but that, that process relies on a competent experienced driver to, to do a good job. Um, another uh, associated risk is the poorly maintained platform, um, including proper water maintenance and repairs when necessary. The problems experienced with rig instability are often associated with failure to adequately maintain and where necessary repair the platform rather than with defects in the design or during the installation. As my mum tells me, a, a stitch in time saves nine look after, nurture, and be kind to your platform, and it will look after you. Um, risks are also site-specific, so, um, uh, and vary depending on the constraints on the job. So a good knowledge and walkover of the site is, uh, is paramount to identify hazards. Um, overzealous excavation of pile arisings is uh, also worth mentioning as a risk, uh, which I hadn't come across, but um, before, but I, I've been on a, a job a couple of years back where the machine driver in attendance of the rig um, to clear up stuff 
a little bit like this, where piling can be very messy, that the, the, the attendance um, driver in the excavator should be clearing and, and, and um, redressing the working platform as it becomes a bit messy. But um, on uh, a particular job I worked on, the um, excavator driver in attendance was a little bit trigger happy in how much he was excavating, uh, which led to a, a great deal of the palm up being excavated out and a, a local a local area being <laughs> totally removed. So we had to cease operations and get plenty more stone thrown in. But really, it, the piling can be a messy operation, but it's important to keep the mat in a serviceable condition to ensure that the factor of safety against failure is, um, is, is maintained. So now, uh, what do we do with all these risks? Understand them, execute good planning to eliminate them, and where they cannot be eliminated, reduce them and ensure that all relevant parties are aware of, of these residual risks. Choosing the right solution to, to start with is uh, a great start uh, to eliminating the risk. Um, and this includes both the right working platform design as well as uh, the correct pile design. This sketch here that I've, I've brought up was one we uh, provided um, to uh, explain what we believed was happening on a particular site. So we had um, that kind of black hatched part is the working platform, which was a stabilized platform. And then we had a soft clay, uh, then a, um, a very, very soft saturated layer, which is shown in that blue and then more soft clay. What was what we believe was happening was um, that we were getting some um, large settlements in the working platform whilst the rig was drilling. Um, when the uh, it was a CFA, so it's a continuous flight auger rig. So when he had his auger in there and it was it was pulling all the material out, there was a very soft saturated layer which was um, being drawn into the pile hole and therefore uh, was uh, being removed as a, a kind of a horizontal layer. This then led to um, depressions in the, in the mat and, um, and large settlements. Um, so perhaps in this very soft soil, another foundation solution uh, would have been more appropriate. Dealing with water is also incredibly important. Usually the formation level is later falls um, and simple drainage solutions are provided if, if necessary. Pile mats used um, over a very short period of time are usually okay uh, without drains subject to the type of soil uh, beneath. However, if the mat is going to be used for an extended period of time, say six weeks or, or more, then um, it's well worth installing a, a good drainage. A soggy platform uh, is not only a messy nightmare to, to work with, uh, but it can also lead to um, a rig falling over. Um, the edge of the platform should also be considered, uh, not left out. It contributes to the strength of the mat as a runoff zone for the two meter zone um, around the piling extents it is of structural importance. A few solutions are shown here, um, which one's a simple batter, um, just at the, at the edge there, one's an embedded mat, and then the other one is um, a gaby basket or, or a Kelly block type of containment. Now let's briefly think about um, the location. If the rig collapse radius is near a well, uh, railway line, then there will be certain processes to go through. Here is an extract from a network rail guidance document that provides some helpful do's and don'ts when piling to reduce the risk of failure affecting a, a railway asset. I'm not gonna provide a step-by-step -step guidance on this. However, it's important that we know that this information is out there and that the pile adjacent to the rail will more than likely have to be submitted as part of a form 2-3 um, submission, which includes an independent design check by an external organization and um, uh, it, don't be caught out by the, the, the lead time that that approval process will uh, may well include. So what does a failure look like? Well, there are a number of different mechanisms of the failure, but a, a common one is a punching shear failure, which is illustrated here. Here you can see the load and, and the soil block being punched down into the soil and displacing um, other, the other soil that's either side of, of that block being pushed up around the loaded area. On the ground, you will see uh, the soil heave up 
around the loaded area and then a large settlement under load. And if you witness this, then it's a good idea to, to stop operations and, and get out the way because things are likely to get a little bit exciting. Uh, and now that takes us on to our first case study, and I'm going to hand you into the capable hands of, of Eddie. So, Eddie, over to you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Josh. Um, so now we're just going to have a run through and look at one of the many case study examples that uh, we've had within geosynthetics that I re re referenced on my at the end of my previous section. And that's to say that the job down at uh, Wood Wharf down in London, right on the banks of the River Thames near Canary Wharf. Uh, as a business, this was a very nice job for us. Uh, firstly, because it was uh, in terms of its size and its complexity, it's always nice to work on complex projects, but also it was it enabled us to have uh, repeat phases with the uh, client in question as once the contractor had seen the benefits of using the jig within his uh, his mat and also the uh, the free of charge in-house design service that we offer uh, throughout through our team of engineers. So it's nice to do, do it's nice to see the sort of the, the sort of interest snowballing with the contractor. Um, so um, first point to note about this site was we weren't just looking at one particular piling rig. There was a couple of different types of piling rig that we had to analyze all the different uh, cases uh, of it operating, either handling, standing and traveling. And you can see on the screen there um, what was de deemed to be the, 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 the critical phases for the two piling mats in question. So the area of this piling mat was 9,000 square meters. Uh, you'll see in a moment that uh, that comprised three layers of geogrid. So broadly speaking, that would be around about 130 rolls of our geogrid product, which would fit on one, maybe two lorries. Compare that with the amount of stone that we're going to be saving um, by incorporating the geogrid layers. Um, a number of stone number of stone lorries traveling around the local roads, uh, creating disruption and, and, and so, so on and so forth. So when we had the soils report in, we analysed the properties and it was decided to use the uh, an SPT of uh, N value of 7, undrained shear strength of 20 kPa, that's roughly 0.8% CBR and a unit weight of 18 kilonewtons per cube. Um, the platform material was selected granular material, class 6 F2. It's very important with these piling mats to use granular material. Whereas in some of the other application areas that we get involved with and we work with, wherever possible, we look to reuse site one material, um, um, basically for its cost savings and also sustainability benefits that it can offer to the to the scheme. But in, with with piling mats with geogrid reinforcement, we're looking to use uh, imported granular uh, material. Next slide, please, Josh. Okay, so you can you can see on this on this on the screen there the the, the two different scenarios on the left hand side the unreinforced platform uh, with a depth of just under two meters uh, and by the time we'd run our analysis three layers of our high modulus uh, biactual geogrid uh, reduced the depth down to uh, just over a meter and a layer of non woven geotextile at the base. Um, next slide please Josh. So just as a summary there of the benefits, a uh, reduction in thickness of some 48%. In this particular case, it varies from site to site, de depending on the exact input parameters, uh, the rigs being used, the in-situ soils and so on and so forth. But typically we would expect that range to be uh, between sort of 30 to 50% um, stone saving that we can achieve. Equally, a cost reduction to the contractor of 30%, so a major, major win for him there. And last but certainly not least, in this age of looking to be um, sustainable and reduce our carbon footprints, uh, when our principal engineer ran a, ran a comparison um, of the two uh, different uh, designs that we see on the screen there, we had a carbon footprint reduction of 53%. Um, carbon footprint and sustainability benefits of this of using geosynthetics uh, have been widely uh, and well documented in recent years by various organisations such as uh, the Waste Resources and Action Programme, RAP, um, a document that was published in September 20, 20, uh, 2010, looked at uh, entitled Sustainable Geosystems in Civil Engineering. So if anybody wants to learn a bit more about that, then there's the document to go and reference. Uh, but we can see there the significant benefits. Some of those are quite quantifiable. We've got less excavation, we've got less muck away, we've got less stone to lay, uh, and, and, and certainly buying it in an expensive uh, area such as the southeast of London, and also quicker to install. Some of the less quantifiable benefits might be less traffic congestion. In this case, we're in a central London location, so traffic congestion is already a, ma a major problem. Um, less noise, therefore less disruption to neighbouring businesses, and less mud on the road, and so on and so forth. 
just one final comment. Uh, this is only a rule of thumb, because I say we do all our designs specific for each individual site, obviously, but as a rule of thumb, obviously to use a geogrid, you've got to buy the geogrid um, and you want to um, find out how much uh, stone depth the use of the geogrid is going to save you. But as a rule of thumb, um, the geogrid needs to reduce the, the, stone, the stone depth in the mat by something of the order of 100 mil to basically offset the cost of purchasing the geogrid. Next slide, please, Josh. Thank you very much. So that's the theory. That's the sort of diagrams for the jobs and some real world photographs. Now, uh, what we can see on the on the on the top left there, um, the non woven geotextile that goes down um, goes down first. That's purely for separation, and then directly above that, uh, the um, high modulus geogrid providing the reinforcement, and also the the overlap there. Um, with these biaxial products, um, they can be unrolled in whichever direction suits the contractor and the site geometry best, basically to look at uh, minimising wastage and overlaps. This isn't the case where um, some of our other solutions that we have with uniaxial geogrids, it's very important to lay, lay them down in the correct orientation. But with this particular type of product, you can you, you can lay it down whichever best suits your, your method of working and say minimising overlaps, wastage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next slide, please, Josh. Thanks. Um, so here you can see a wider angle photograph of the of the same same scheme. Uh, and I said it. I know I said it earlier, but I'll reiterate it again. It's very important that the contractor needs to coordinate his working method so the stone is placed without the need for plants to track directly on the products. That's that's a big no no, and uh, it's given me quite a few sleepless nights over over the years. Perfectly okay, as you see in the uh, left hand side of that photograph, for the site operatives to carefully walk around it and unroll the geogrids, um, but no tracked plant at all um, on the on the geogrids synthetic products until it's got a, a minimal cover of stone over the top. Thanks, Josh. So here we go, a similar photograph to uh, Josh's uh, wonder shot a few slides ago, where he said, wow, look at that, isn't that exciting? Uh, that's what that mat looks like up at the full height. You can easily see the finished platform with the various site plant busily working away um, and undertaking their, their, their various functions. Um, I've seen a question pop up in the in, in the chat box while Josh was talking, uh, which I can address now, hopefully, is that um, the key one of the key factors of these um, geogrids is, is that they're, they're absolutely designed, once you've put them in the piling mat, they're absolutely designed to be piled through um, with, without damage and without adversely affecting the stability of, of the mat. Um, this isn't necessarily the case for other types of geosynthetics that we use in some of our other application areas, but for, this, for these types of uh, um, high modulus geogrids, that's what they're designed to do to, to construct the mat, reduce the stone depth and say, offer all the savings like we've seen, but then be, be piled through by the various types of piling, piling equipment. Next slide, please, Josh. So there we go. When all said and done, that's a, a, a sort of aerial shot of the, of the finished scheme, or at least a computer generated impression of it. You can see in the bottom right hand corner there, a computer generated um, impression of the six or so high rise buildings that were constructed on the site. And you can see uh, the site's very close proximity to the River Thames down in central London. Um, hence the reason why the ground conditions that we had to design with, our engineers had to design with, uh, were, were quite so poor, but a very pleasing result for, for us and also the contractor um, on, on that particular case study. So that's me, and now I'm going to hand you back to Josh. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the fantastic benefits of a stabilised mat, um, leading on from what I was discussing earlier. Uh, this is on um, another project um, on the Thames in central London, uh, Good Luck uh, Hope project. The reason why uh, I assume uh, Eddie's taken his um, case study in a similar area to mine is because the... the the ground properties in that particular area are very poor because it, you're right the high water table and um very soft clay in this area so it it um produces some it's a kind of a crucible for some interesting innovative design um so <clears throat> the the project was in uh, central london uh, on the thames and the uh, pile mat that we designed was a, a, a cement um opc stabilized pile mat to support various different rigs. The worst case being the, a big Casa Grande rig, which had a, uh, a width of track of one meter and then a, a track pressure of 287 kilonewtons per meter squared. The soil was a very soft, cohesive made ground with a high water table. Um, uh, the SPT value was N3. Uh, this was a very soft, very soft clay for CU 13 and a half. Um, the, the provided solution was a 6% uh, OPC stabilised mat, which is 450 deep with a 100 mil um, wearing course on, on top of that. So 
What was so damn good about this, Matt? Well, I'm going to tell you what's so damn good about it. The stabilized material is stronger than the 6F2 when mixed with cement at around 2% or above. Um, that means that the overall depth of the, of the, of the mat is, is smaller to start with. Uh, in addition, the material of the mat is already on site. Um, it's already in the ground. All you've got to do is turn up with some um, cement and, and spread it over and a mix, so limited muck away, with benefits similar to, to what Eddie was discussing earlier about um, limited traffic and costs of mucking away. And also, this means you don't have to um, muck away as much and import limited amount of materials because you're only really importing the crushed concrete wearing course, which is on top. Um, also, uh, on one of my jobs, it's been used as an impermeable layer to cap off contaminated ground. Um, the topsoil would be placed above the stabilized soil um, in the permanent condition uh, for used for housing and, and gardens and things. And, and this meant that on the brownfield site where there was lots of nasties in the ground, these nasties were kept away from the end user through uh, this method because the stabilized soil provides an impermeable barrier um, this can um, be in a bit of an issue because there are some setbacks with that being impermeable, which is that water control can be an issue if not properly planned. There are simple methods that we can employ, but it needs it needs thought being thought about and, and planned. Also, a very high uh, cement content can cause some difficulties uh, in in piling to get to actually get through the mat. But um, in experience, cement contact uh, contents up to um, eight percent are generally okay. Usually, we're we're looking around stabilizing about um, two percent to uh, six percent in that kind of realm. And we can hear, you see here a nice cross section through the mat. The grey stabilized material is at the top, and then the formation level is below. Um, the ground here was very challenging because we had the very soft soil uh, and being right next to the river with a high water table. This job was an example of where we used specialist software uh, called Limit State Geo to, to model the pile map and loadings as a way to ratify our design. So you can see here a, a, a beautiful example of a punching shear mechanism, um, which was expected following the initial hand calculations. Software like this is, is great for tricky situations, but a note of warning, as with any design, hand calcs or software, you need to fully understand what you're doing to ensure you're getting the, right, the correct output. Rubbish in equals rubbish out. Uh, and, and that, like I say, that's not just for software, it goes for hand calculations or anything. So a good understanding of um, what you're doing on the ground is, is paramount. Um, once the area was constructed, it had um, plate bearing tests carried out on top of it. Um, and that leads us on to uh, our final section of the presentation, really. So welcome now to the crash course in piling platform verification using plate bearing tests. So what is a test? Um, a plate bearing test uh, is essentially putting a, a steel plate on the ground that you can see there underneath a piece of plant to, uh, to use as kentledge to, to push the plate into the into the working platform once it's completed. Um, sometimes they're carried out at formation level to verify ground parameters, uh, but on, in every case, they're, they're carried out on top of the platform. Uh, why are they important? They are necessary to verify the design and construction of the mats and essentially bring it into use. No mat should be brought into use without uh, having been tested and approved by the design engineer, preferably um, and that should happen before the rig enters onto the mat. How many tests to carry out? Well, it's generally uh, one test per 300 to 400 meters squared, but sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on how similar the ground conditions is around the site and the size of the platform. But the number of tests will be specified uh, by the designer on the uh, working platform certificate, which I mentioned earlier is the design output. Um, where to test? Well, um, even spread out evenly throughout the mat to get a representative um, sample of, of how the mat is performing. Um, you don't have to do them directly over where the pile locations are. It's generally where the rig is going to operate. And we recommend that uh, the mat is retested if it's not been used and left um, sat idle for six weeks or longer just to verify the mat before the, the rig goes on there. 
So here we get a bit of a zoomed in closer look of what's actually going on. We've got the Kentledge on top, which is the cross beam of the, the piece of plant there. There's a load cell directly underneath that to tell us how much we're loading it up to. Then we've got hydraulic jack. Then we've got a test plate, uh, which is usually 0.6 meters in diameter. And then sand bedding just for even bearing and then uh, the, the granular surface of the mat itself. That little rig set up there, which you can see is um, the to measure the, the, the settlement as the, as the load um, is applied. So what kind of results are we looking for? Here are a couple of uh, pretty good examples. Uh, we're generally looking for less than 10 mil settlement under rig track loadings and uh, a linear relationship between load and settlement. So that's essentially a nice uh, straightish line when we look at um, uh, going along and settling and, and loading it up. This one here is an absolute fantastic result on a recently stabilized, um, chemically, chemically stabilized mat uh, constructed over some pretty poor soil. Uh, I mean, just look at that. That's, that's that's gone up to 140 tons per meter squared pressure, and it's still less than 10 mil settlement, and a pretty linear relationship between load and settlement. So that, that is an outstanding result, and it's a, a credit to the the contractors who um, constructed that mat. And here we can see. Uh, oh, beg your pardon. What's happened there? Yeah, so testing to the right pressure is also very important. Um, it must be specified as part of the design and we want to replicate the loadings from the pile rig as close as possible. Therefore, we need to replicate the same pressure bulb. The influence zone of the pressure bulb increases with the load width, as you can see here. We've got a one meter wide track at, on the left hand side, a 9.9 meter wide track and then a 0.6 meter diameter plate. So if the plate was loaded to the same pressure that is expected to be beneath the track, then the equivalent pressure at depth would not be representative of what we're getting for the rigs. This is very important for when we have a weaker soil at depth um, and how much greater that pressure needs to be, it really depends on the, the track width, but it can be up to three times the track pressure for the to be used on the test for say a one meter wide track uh, and this is an example of a plate test which shows that the upper layers are really really stiff so you can see there's very little settlement uh, in the initial stages when we get up to around 300 kilonewtons per meter squared but then as that pressure bulb starts to enter softer soils which are perhaps beneath the platform uh, then we start to get um, a settlement um, and that's at a continuous rate, um, but at a much higher rate than at the initial platform. So you can see there it's going through some stiff soil, which is taking that load absolutely fine. And then it reaches the, the pressure stress reaches something that's a bit softer and that's where we get the true form. So that's why it's important that we load it up to the correct pressure. Here are some um, uh, poor examples uh, for comparison. Um, so test A, uh, this shows that the soil is homogenous, so it's it's quite um, similar throughout the depth. There's not different layers of different soils, but it's generally poorly compacted at depth. The settlement's getting worse at a pretty constant rate, and we're going up to settlements of uh, 40 mil plus there. Test B, this is a soft upper layer, and... Um, but then good lower levels. So you can see here that that, that line that I've put on there, um, if this upper layer was compacted nicely, then we would expect a, something more like that, which would be a pass. Um, a test result like this can usually be rectified by um, further proof rolling the, the upper layers and, and compacting them. So that brings the that initial settlement down. And then test C is similar to test B, but, um, uh, but worse really. The result is improving, as you can see there, but um, it's, it's generally failing as it's it's much too high there. And that that's taken that photo has been taken of the uh, tester's kind of little PDA system, which which he has on site while as he's carrying out the test. And those other ones are a published test that you often get sent back once those tests are done. 
some similar designs in the working platform world um, are listed here. So working platform for cranes, scaffold foundations, short term hoist bases and, and mass climber bases and haul roads as well. Other uses of geogrid, uh, which are which have been used to support piling operations in tight spaces are stabilized slopes um, and walls or embankments. Uh, this is an area within itself. Uh, I thought I'd mention it here, but we have got an event coming up which is going to discuss those um, in detail. So, um, uh, because it is a, kind of a, a subject in its own, but you can see there, Ed, you earlier mentioned that, that the geogrid uses a biaxial geogrid, uh, which worked in, in both directions. But for these structures, generally a, a, a uniaxial geogrid is used. And you can see that, that that's what they're using here on this wall. And that really concludes the presentation. Um, so if you want to know more, there's a whole host of information out there. There's a whole chapter on site roads and working platforms in temporary works principles, which is definitely worth a read. Uh, there's some other helpful documents out, um, listed that are listed here. Uh, geosynthetics, you can get more information, news, specification sheets, case studies, and technical support on their products uh, from their website, which is, which is listed there as well. Um, and now it's time for, well, a quick break for us to get a breather and then uh, we'll start the questions.